Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's My Head podcast today. I'm joined by Mr. Eric Kaplan. Eric, how are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Right off the bat, man, what does it feel like to, to have more men cry at something you worked on than Fast and the Furious 7 with the Paul Walker's death and then them editing him in there to ride off in the sunset? So what's it like to make more men cry by writing I'm, prou I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. I think um, male crying is a good thing. Uh, I think uh, men are also victims of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. and to be in touch with our feelings is all to the good, both for ourselves and for uh, whatever others we might be interacting with. Can't agree more. It feels good. It feels good. Next question. This is good. I think we're going to be able to get to some questions today. I answered that one. I think I kind of knocked it out of the park. So let me have your second question. It's for sure. Anyway, another thing I'm pushing is drinking coffee from bowls. How come we drink uh, soup from mugs, but never coffee from bowls. Something to think about. You can check it out, uh, coffeefrombowls.com, which I don't own, but uh, someone ought to buy it and give it to me as a birthday gift. When's your birthday? February 23rd. February 23rd. So we missed it this year. Yeah, yeah. But for next year, assuming the internet sleeps on this, this whole coffee and bowls tip, uh, then I'll be looking in my inbox for a gift from you uh, in 11 months' time. <laughs> Ladies, and I'm pretty sure you're going to be amazed there because I'm pretty sure it's going to, something's going to happen at least. Coffee and bowls. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Dot com or dot net. Which one would you prefer? If they had dot com, you want to buy it out? Yeah. 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 Well, I, we probably need to get all of them. But otherwise, there'll be some kind of lurid picture of naked ladies on dot net <laughs> and it'll bring shame to the brand. Now, there's anything to be ashamed about being naked ladies, but in our puritanical culture, it can generate blowback particularly if you're hoping to pitch your website to to preteens, which I am. All right, well, we'll try to steer clear away from that. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, let's get back to- they, they, they emerged from naked ladies. Anyway, children did, but nevertheless, we're very schizophrenic about that whole topic. <laughs> this is going to be a fun one, I could already tell, man. Like I said, thank Don't you. Your answer, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Eric here wrote uh, quite a few episodes, but one that the fans really wanted to know about more than anything really was Jurassic Park. Jurassic yeah. Park, excuse me. Um, so I've never really had, uh, I've had a few writers and a few artists on here, and we've never really went into detail as far as your method or method for writing. But you specifically, when you get handed something like this, did they give you a concept, the idea, or did you 100% come up with my concept? Your concept. Nobody gave it to me. Beautiful. So yeah, how, how does my concept? How does that work, man? Did you have this the story in the back of your mind? Said, hey, I want to tell. Well, I here's here there were two things going on. Well, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do you want to continue your question? Oh no, you're perfectly fine. Go oh, for okay. it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm interested in the topic of um, love and loss mm -hmm. and mistakes. So it, that's sort of my mind is sort of looking for ways to express that. Um, I was working on Futurama, which is about a guy who has lost his whole world, um, Fry. So I sort of thought, huh. And the thing that I suggested, um, I've also been intrigued ever since I was a little kid by writing about deep time. Like always kind of liked the idea of like a being that can survive multiple ages of the universe. Um, and this is something that comes up in Indian thought. There's a crow. In Indian thought, the universe is destroyed every few trillion years, and then it's recreated, and then it, it just goes through this cycle. But there is a crow who survives these cosmic cycles of, of uh, boom and bust. So that always interested me. When I was a little kid, I was working on a story, although my mother said it was lunacy, but it was about some kind of a weird monster that um, it, the way it lives is um, it's like becomes like a gigantic dragon and then it, it becomes it sort of goes into um, suspended animation and then like thousands of years later it comes back to consciousness and it just finds itself as like a little worm living inside an immense skeleton which is its own skeleton from the previous uh, incarnation of this creature so so that had always kind of interested me it had interested me um, and then I pitched to David Cohen, who's the, the you know, creator, co-creator of Futurama, um, what if Fry goes to a, a uh, museum and sees his own mummified mother? Um, and, 
And he was like, oh, that seems cool, but it seems like it might bum people out to have like a dead mother as this, this central image of a comedy program. Uh, so I said, well, what about a dog? So he said, okay, dog. Um, so that's, that's how that story came to be. Um, and then kicking it around, it was pretty clear, like if this is a, a show where the moral is sort of like, don't throw love away, or you know, if you're gonna give yourself a, a story about um, why you shouldn't be with someone, that that story might be wrong and the sort of the, the tragic loss of love, that it, there needs to be a third uh, vertex um, and I hope I can use the word vertex with your audience, but you know, a third corner to yeah. the uh, love triangle. Um, so that was Bender. Bless you. Excuse me. Uh, I don't have COVID. Uh, I have allergic rhinitis uh, from the spring where yeah. I am. Um, but uh, yeah, hay fever, you could call it. It's, it's not a fever, um, but uh, and nothing to do with hay. Um, but um, th this, this, this story kind of, it came in sort of two pieces. The first piece was like, well, he should be longing for some love and some connection with a being that he lost from his previous life. And then the second piece was there should be a, a love or friendship or connection piece of the puzzle in his present life, and that's Bender. And that's sort of what created the story. Um, and then the final interesting personal piece of the puzzle was, so I always knew it needed to end on a tragic note where we learn that the dog loved him all along and that he should have um, defrosted it or cloned it or whatever science fiction nonsense we, we came up with to stand in for resurrecting this dog and getting it back. Um, and my grandparents, uh, uh, Edward uh, Kaplan and Doe Kaplan, used to play the piano and sing a song uh, popularized by Connie Francis uh, that's, that had the lyric, uh, if, it, if it took forever, I would wait for you. For a thousand summers, I would wait for you, which fit perfectly the story because the dog uh, had been waiting for him in that mummified state for a thousand years. So that was really a nice moment. And that kind of tied it around personally for me. It became a story that was very personally uh, uh, connected with my own uh, uh, life with my grandparents. Um, and, and that's the answer to that question. With all of, I just want to sidebar for just a second. With all yeah, of the episodes you've written, have you tried to do that where you've tied it in personally, whether it's some kind of connection you've had with a family member like your grandparents or? Well, you know, I mean, I think, I think writing is a little bit like being a spider. You, you're sort of taking things from your insides and manifesting them into the world as a whole. So whether I try or don't try, I'm going to end up doing that. I'm going to end up, and anyone who knows me is going to look at anything that I write and be like, well, that's that, and that's that, and he was always had this thing about this, and there it is. You know, I think that's inevitable. Anytime you write from the heart, uh, and, and you need to write from the heart to go to the heart. Yeah. Um, anytime you write from the heart, it's going to be an expression of, of who you are, and that includes your childhood, your parents, your best friend when you were in second grade, all that stuff is going to end up in some sort of transfigured form in your writing. It's a little bit like a dream, you know, that sometimes you'll have a dream and be like, what, what was that thing that I was afraid of? And then you'd be like, oh, it kind of reminds me of this conversation I had or this thing that scared me when I was a kid, you know, because the dream, your eyes are closed. So the things that you're seeing have to be issuing from you mm -hmm. rather than from the immediate generation environment yeah. that you're in if you think about it yeah i got you with yeah. with something like that i mean how taxing is it on you emotionally though when you go back and you reread or you watch that episode does it do you feel you feel like we feel i guess is what i'm getting at uh when i'm creating it yes um i i don't know that i um ever go back and watch anything that I write. I, I can't remember doing that. Is that just I'm not sure I must have. It's not like I have a policy not to, but I have a tendency not to. I sort of have a tendency of sort of like um, moving on, you yeah. know? Um, but, but certainly um, there, there's, a, there's a challenging, emotionally challenging aspect to writing 
Um, and part of it also has to do with um, it's seeking because um, it's it's communication, right? So it's seeking a emotional connection with the world, and it's kind of seeking not just people saying, "Oh, you're good," but also, "Oh, I get it. I see the world like that too." Um, and 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 if I think if writing is courageous, you're going into some area where you're not sure that that's going to be the response. Mm -hmm. So you might, you're on some level, there's the fear. If I say that, are people going to think I'm a weirdo or think people going to think I'm a pervert or people going to think, oh, I just don't feel that way. Uh, that's strange or, oh, you're a bad person for feeling that way. So, so there's some degree, I, I shouldn't put it in the passive. Uh, for me, I find that I'm wrestling with that when I'm writing, uh, trying to find the courage to express something and, and, you know, feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Because I do think that courage does mean that the thing you, that you're dealing with is is scary to you. Otherwise, you're not displaying courage. You're displaying uh, uh, some form of insensitivity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I got you. Um, so, with this episode specifically, or any episode you've ever written for anything, do you have yeah. an idea of how it ends, and then you work backwards, or do you start from the beginning? Yeah, what's your process? I always have an idea of how it ends, and it works backwards. Well, um, I, I shouldn't say always but most of the time. I, I've recently started experimenting. I heard about this thing on Twitter that there are some writers who are pantsers and some writers who are outliners. And outliners come up with, as you say, the end, the halfway point, and you know, the, the arc and all that. And pantsers are people who write by the seat of their pants, that they just write something. And then, when, then they write something after that. And then they write something after that. And I was like, wow, that's, what a scary, weird way of doing it. Um, so I tried to write something like that and, and I did, and I was actually happy with it. So I might try and write something like that again, but usually I do have a sort of a point or an architecture in my mind and I know, and I want, so I want to get somewhere. And then that means to, in order to get there, certain other things have to happen along the way. Um, and, and I do need to figure that out. But sometimes there is a little bit of a, of, of a gamesmanship or a self gamesmanship, because um, if, it's, if, if I work out all the issues in the outline, it becomes very tedious to actually write the thing, <laughs> you know, because I've already worked it all out in the outline and now it's just sort of like laying down bricks. And maybe that's okay to lay down bricks, but, but sometimes I sort of feel like if there's some sense of sort of uh, excitement and fear, <laughs> in the actual writing that that will be transmitted to the reading experience so um so i don't know a little bit of both but but to me it does sort of feel, feel like i'm like i'm writing something now and i keep going back and forth about how it's going to end mm -hmm. um but i sort of know what's going to happen right before it ends <laughs> so so i have that and then i just don't know like you know what's going to happen at the end end so you know i don't know a mixed man now, with something like that, we'll get back to Futurama in just a second, but I like talking about whenever we can go in different directions, because there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are either working in animation, that want to work in animation, um, they write for animation, or they want to write for animation. Yeah. So it's time that we can talk craft, and, and you guys yeah. are for sure that I have on here are masters of your crafts. Um, I, any advice that you can give somebody that might be wrestling with that same thing, like they don't know how to end it, or they don't know if they want to go this way or that way. What kind of advice can you give to somebody that, that's probably having that same issue right now? Well, okay, what I would say is, the genesis of the script should be a question you genuinely care about and that you don't know the answer to. Like it should be something kind of kind of heavy, like, you know, if your dad was mean to you, the question should be like, is it okay to forgive a father who's mean to his child? Like it should be something that kind of hooks you personally in and is a question. And it's a question that you're struggling with. That's what I would say is that make sure that it's a your whatever work you're dealing with is dealing with a question where you could easily go either way and that you feel it's a question for you. It hooks into your heart. It's not just an abstract question for somebody else. It's a question for you. Um, and if you set it up like that, uh, you're off to a good start. 
I censored myself. I was going to say you can't go wrong. And then I heard that in my head. And before I said it, I said, <laughs> well, you can go wrong. That's not true. Don't say that. But I will say you're off to a good start. Beautiful. Thank you for that, man. Like I said, there's a lot of people that, that really, really enjoy when you guys can go super deep cuts or you guys can give any wisdom that you've learned along the way. It helps. I think that, that one is true. And, and the other thing is, by the way, so I said, oh, your father's a mean alcoholic and you could write something about a mean alcoholic. It doesn't need to be obvious that that's what it's about. It could be about a robot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it could be about a baby chicken uh, who suspects that the farmer is just raising the chicken in order to eat it. You know, you can transfigure it every which way but Sunday, but but deep down, you should know that it's about something that genuinely matters to you. That's what I think, I don't know. So is the thing you're working on is a self-aware chicken? Is that what you're working on a now? Self-aware chicken, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world where instead of chickens being inside an egg and the egg cracking and the chicken going from outside the egg into the universe. It's a world where the chicken is one with the whole universe except for one area. And then when it's born, it breaks through and comes inside the egg. So it's a kind of a, a topological mix up on the famous egg chicken story. Which one? Really. That, that's a joke, but you know. <laughs> well, now we know which one comes first, man. So get back to, to, to Jurassic Park. Obviously, this was written quite some time ago, and I hate asking right. type of questions, but I'd be remiss not to ask, man. Uh, was there a part in this episode that was difficult for you to get through? Or obviously, animation is very collaborative. Um, so, did you have to? Is there anybody that you would speak to, like, hey, man, I can't really flush this idea out 100%. Maybe I can bend your ear for just a little bit. Did you have anybody that you could do that to? No, I was working with the whole staff of Futurama. I wasn't off in a cave and somewhere or a garret. Um, sure. Uh, writing it uh, in in from every from the smallest to the largest detail and joke the other writers uh were were deeply involved and david cohen was deeply involved um and and then it was storyboarded and um directed over a rough draft yeah. um so, so yeah, you know, it, it, there's a lot of people who didn't, I didn't just bounce ideas off of them. Um, I, uh, I uh, collaborated with them and they contributed a bunch to it. Beautiful. Uh, what was the hardest part of this episode for you to write? What was the hardest part of the episode for me to write? Um, Oh, and, and, and Swinton O. Scott uh, directed it. Um, and he did a fabulous job directing it. So, so he, he, you should have him on the podcast too. Um, because animation, like the animation directors are really in many ways, the unsung heroes of uh, the uh, entertainment industry because they're bringing a huge amount of um, creative decision-making in order to take these words and turn them into an episode of Futurama. Um, but you asked what was the um, hardest part to write. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think committing to the tone was the hardest part. Um, I think in, in many ways, like, like, like there's structure and then there's tone. And structure is a very analytical thing and it's pretty easy to discuss. And tone is equally important, maybe more important, because very often what we come away with from a piece of art, like from a dream, is a feeling of emotion, the vibe of it. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Pelly Gritzer, uh, he's a researcher uh, and, and a philosopher, a lyric critic, and he writes about the theory of vibe, um, uh, which in my mind has something to do with tone. Um, and it, it has to do with, um, what are the sort of things that people could say or could feel or could happen in this particular aesthetic world? Yeah. Um, and I think that's remarkably difficult to do, it was very hard here because it was something that was supposed to be funny and sad and not to whipsaw from one or the other, but to kind of be both yeah. throughout. That was very hard. 
and and it really um the music did a lot and and i wasn't 100 percent sure it was gonna work until i saw the animatic with the music mm -hmm. and then the music is sort of like oh so there's some jokes and stuff but the music lets you know that it's okay to feel yeah. um and and you do feel and that was very very um unexpected for me it was strange it, there was an element of um of kind of grace to it that just sort of like wait a second now there's actually some emotion coming through here and it's a sad emotion and then it was even like is that okay are we allowed to put out a half hour space cartoon on fox that makes the viewer feel sad and i was like well, I, I guess, I mean, no one's telling, no one's stopping us. So I guess we're allowed to, you know, which is sort of the, one of the, one of the basic questions of ethics is what can you get away with? Yeah. Did you ever get any kickback on anything? Did it, did you get to say everything you wanted to say in this episode or was there any kickback or did you have to cut anything? I, did I get to say everything I wanted to say in this episode? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember any sense of me saying, I'm not a terribly soapbox kind of guy in the sense that usually I feel like whatever I have to say is going to be kind of uh, integral, like it's going to be in every piece of it, like a hologram, like it's going to be in every piece of it um, or not in every piece of it, but it never feels to me like, um, oh, there's a particular sentence that I want to put in and someone could prevent me from putting in. I mean, someone could prevent me from doing the whole thing and, and that's happened. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's more going to be something kind of like, like, uh, like imagine you took a, a sponge and you put it in a, in a glass of tomato juice, mm -hmm. that the tomato juice would permeate the sponge. So that's, that's, I think what my writing is like when it succeeds is, is, is a, is a, a sponge soaked in tomato juice. <laughs> I like it, man. Uh, I'm gonna, how do I Don't say let that? the dog get a hold of that or he'll <laughs> eat it and you'll have to take him to the doctor. So, so we're, talk, we're talking dogs. This whole, do this whole episode was on a dog. Uh, mine's actually sitting right behind me. Oh, can we see him? Bring him on, bring yeah. him in the camera. Let him ask a question. Hi, dog. Here, she's Hi, the fabulous dog. She's being all shy and coy. Oh, now let me ask you that's could her you, could you give her a treat oh all the time but could you give her one now for the folks at home and for me let me see if i have one up here she usually gets carrots carrots i'm yeah. pretty sure that dogs eat meat not carrots <laughs> are you sure about that have you spoken to a dog scientist well she you gets be, uh, you may be thinking of rabbits she gets rabbits carrots. Carrots. Dogs, eat meat. dogs in fact eat rabbits ironically enough for the rabbits for, the, for these ones, I have to be very, very careful on what I give them because the diet that the dogs are on, uh, I've got two Huskies. Um, I always wanted one. When I got out of the Navy uh, and I didn't die, I was like, you know what? I've always wanted a Husky. It's my favorite dog. I loved, I loved these dogs. I loved wolves back in the day. Um, and I was like, I always wanted one. So I got this one. And then I was like, you know what? I got a female. Maybe we should try to get a male and then maybe we can breed them. Great we'll idea. One try, and then if it works, it works. We'll get them fixed, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Come to find out, the male didn't know which side to fuck, so we did tried it? to help him. Yeah, we tried to help him out. Did, did it have a? I mean, did it know there were two? Like, did it try a couple of sides, and then ultimately no, it just try? It just tried face fucking the entire time, right? So, what a yeah. Fool, so, what a foolish and perverted dog. <laughs> so I, I I I texted the uh, I texted the breeder. And I was like, hey, uh, you know, he's not really trying to find like he's trying, but he's not finding the right spot. They're like, well, sometimes you got to help them. Sometimes for the oh. first time, you got to just put them back there and then they can do the work for the rest of them. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've made it this far into the episode and you're where you're talking dog fucking now, congratulations. But so we helped him out. Right. So her name, the red one is Ollie. Right. So that's yeah. my that's the one I got when I got right out. And then the other one I got was Diggle, because I don't know if you ever watched the uh, Green Arrow TV show they had on the CW not too long ago, Arrow, but uh, I named them after Ollie, Oliver Queen, and John yes. Diggle. Diggle. Yes. yes. So I've got Diggle in my arms, and she's like, just put him, put him on the backside, right? He'll do the rest of it. So as soon as I picked this him up. This is a stud. 
You yes. have two females, and then well, you I have, have. I have one male, one female. Okay, which is the female is Diggle or the female is Ollie? Female's Ollie. That's the one I just showed you, the red and white. Diggle is the male. Yeah, Diggle's the male. Can we bring Diggle in here for the podcast? Oh, no, he's downstairs playing with the kids. So next time, next time though, I'll make sure I bring him up. And he's loud as shit, too. I had to That's actually good. start breaking him up between uh, tw- between the episodes because I get a lot of fan people just, hey, man, put your dogs outside. Put your dogs outside. Are they, are they Malamutes? No, they're Huskies. So they're yeah. not mute. The Malamute being a mute and the Husky being a non-mute. The Husky being yeah, a They're loud as so, shit. So what's the end of this, of this dog intimacies tale? Oh, uh, so we, I, they were like, just put him on the back end and he'll do the rest. So I picked him up and then he looked at me like, come on, man. Like I was cock blocking him. Right. So I go and I put him and he just looked over at me and then slumped off. Like he was just defeated. So I'm like, huh? So I texted the, the breeder again. So I was like, I did what you told me to do. He looked defeated. And then she was like, what do you mean defeated? And I was like, I literally put him where you told me to put him and uh he just he sulked off like like i cock blocked him and yeah, she's yeah. like huh she's like well he may not be ready because he's about a year old they say studs are generally a year for 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 uh for when you want to start so i yeah. said okay we'll wait the next heat cycle because he, each heat cycle is about six months to eight months apart depending on the dog so we tried again same thing went straight for the face and i'm like man what the fuck is going on and it's getting a little hot in here not because we're talking dog fucking, but no, no, like, you may be getting uh, emotionally aroused. <laughs> Maybe I know my fans off because it's, it's starting to make this real weird noise too. Whenever it starts going, um, so I had it turned off. But uh, so we tried it again six months later. Same thing. Did not want to have anything to do with it. And if I tried to help him, he was like, "Man, fuck this. I'm just going to go sit over here in the corner." So eventually, we just said, "Screw it." We got them both fixed because I was very afraid. We had actually lost uh, a year ago, or yeah, a year and a half ago, a year ago, somewhere around. There, we lost my mom's dog. My mom was living with me for a little while when she was in between moving from West Virginia. You down listen to the podcast. Um, well, she shares everything I does, everything I do, and she was my number without one listening to it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, sometimes yeah, sometimes she'll listen, sometimes she won't. But uh, she wasn't really into your care. name, Lori. Hi, Lori, if you're listening. <laughs> so I'm gonna make sure she listens to this one because she'll get a big kick out of all this. So, uh, but well, she won't get a kick out of the story I'm about to tell. But uh, she had a she had a 120 pound golden retriever, right? He's about six years old. Uh, he, you would think, but he was just a massive dog. The the the. I didn't know they, didn't know they ran so large. Oh, he he was a big boy. He wasn't fat because he he was very fit. He would have been a perfect stud if that's what what he was meant for. He was just a beautiful dog, big dog, sweetest dog in the world too. Uh, he ended up getting cancer, is what we think. Uh, think he had oh. stomach cancer, and uh, she came inside. She was crying. I was like, "What's wrong? Where's Mac?" And she's like, "Max laying outside. He can't can't get up." So I was like, "Oh shit." So I go outside and I look at him and he can't get up. His gums are all white. Pick him up and I'm taking him to the to the car and he dies in my arms. Right. Sorry to hear that. Well, he came back because all of the blood had rushed to his stomach. And then when I picked him up, he was so massive. And picking up 120 pound anything from the floor at complete dead weight is almost impossible luckily i fucking gutted through it and i could get him up and i get him to the car they took him to the hospital he, you know, he did not make it to the hospital he ended up passing away but the only reason i tell you that story is because that's why i fixed the male and the female because i was so afraid of because he my my male is a big dog so he's about 95 pounds they have a they run the risk of getting prostate cancer if you let them get too old without getting clipped so that's the first thing we do i didn't want to try it anymore i didn't he wasn't interested right. in, in trying to trying to mate or trying to breed so, you know, we got them fixed. But I don't know why we're talking about dog fucking. I guess my question is, do you think, I'm trying to remember, like, I, I don't remember a time when I didn't know how personally. Yeah. But I don't know if I, if I heard it from someone in the schoolyard or I saw a, a movie or something. And I'm wondering if the dog growing up around people like whether he would have needed the example of an older dog like if he saw another stud uh being intimate with a female bitch dog whether that would have made him think oh i think i'd like to do that you know but but not having had that experience maybe that led to his confusion maybe that's what it is because sometimes of course he, he also i don't think knew and and i was never i've never been in this position you're either going to have sex successfully now or you'll be castrated tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> no well, pressure. 
there there's there's always something to say because you always like i can't do this i can't do this and you see somebody do it and you're like oh shit maybe i can do it so yeah, maybe yeah. maybe we just start what was it uh it was fucking coffee from a bowl now yeah. we got dog fucking dog well i don't want, i don't even want to put that one out there but yeah. we gotta make infomercial uh, by videos. the way we cannot get that because i'm sure it exists <laughs> i'm not searching for it me neither <laughs> but yeah it exists sir I'm pretty sure there's infomercials on where yeah we're both men of the world we're not naive <laughs> so getting back to to you and Jurassic Park so I figure with this one because like I told you before we hit oh, by the way here's another thing the name came from David Goodman not from me the title Jurassic Park is David, David Goodman, Goodman. huh yeah. so when you guys write an episode, I like how we segued right back to it. When you guys write an episode, do you guys come up with the names yourself, or is that something that's usually come out from outside? Maybe one of the we come people? up with the name ourselves. Okay. Do you have a? Do you remember what the name might have been first, or were you just stumped on a name? Oh, what my initial name was? Yeah, I don't remember. Okay, maybe it'll maybe it'll come back to you a little bit. No, it won't. No? <laughs> I guarantee it won't. I do remember that my initial title for Why Must I Be a Crustacean in Love was a muck crab. Um, yeah. yeah. And people found that stupid. But then Matt Groening continued to find Why Must I Be a Crustacean in Love also to be stupid with the reasonably good argument that the word crustacean sounds nothing like the word teenager at all. Yeah. Um, but but I, I, I found the 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 clammy ham-fistedness of it to be funny yeah um, which is a risky thing to say always because then you're sort of like so the the thing that's good about your joke is that it's not funny so what would it take for your joke to not be good it seems like you sort of figured it out so everything you do is right um but in any case yeah i did initially think yeah a muck crab but as for what this one was called i don't know with with an episode how long do you guys usually get to write it Oh, and by the way, Seymour Butts was not my idea. That the, Calling the dog Seymour was not my idea. Making the dog look like what it looked like was entirely Matt Groening. Uh, well, not entirely because it was a character designer, but he was he was writing team on that. Um, so there's tons of aspects of this thing that, that I not just didn't entirely do, but did 0% what the dog looked like, what the dog was named, what the episode was called. Um, I'm sorry, but what was your, your next puzzle? Oh, uh, I was just asking. Uh, yes, well, first off, before we ask that, because I was going to ask you how long do you have to write an episode? What's your favorite Matt Groening story? Do you have one or favorite interaction you might have had with him? Favorite interaction with Matt Groening. Um, no, all my interactions with Matt Groening tie is equally good. They're, they've <laughs> all been delightful. Well, what's, um, what's one you think of when you think of Matt Groening? If that's a little bit easier. Oh, or a little bit um, more. Well, I found it fascinating that um, he was always committed to writing his comic strip. Mm -hmm. Even in the middle of production, whatever was happening, he would always make sure to get his strip in on time. And I thought it was quite interesting that he views himself sort of um, I think first and foremost is a cartoonist um, rather than a mogul, because he is a mogul, but he's a cartoonist first and a mogul second, I would say. So I found that quite interesting about working with the, the great man, Matt Greening. Cool, man. And uh, last question before we rotate the fans questions. And the only reason we're cutting this one off a little bit earlier is because, ladies and gentlemen, you guys submitted more questions. And I told, I told Eric this, more questions times three than anybody's ever submitted. I, I was blown away. Uh, and that sounds like a backhand compliment. I don't mean it that way, Eric, at all. Um, no, I'm happy that the fans are asking questions because if you don't ask questions, how will you ever learn? Exactly. Um, and, you know, so we'll, we'll definitely cut it off. And if you had fun after this, we'll, we'll get you back on a little bit more in depth on, on, uh, on, <laughs> on your entire life and career when it comes My to My entire that. life. Okay, well, that'll take a long time. I mean, even first grade, that's like three podcasts. Oh, that's okay, man. We got nothing but time, man. Great. Um, but before we do that, man, I know you said you had a book and it says Does Santa Exist? Yeah. That's, that's Santa Exist, a philosophical investigation. Um, that is, so So my um, 
at this point, I almost sort of say it's a hobby, is a philosophy. Um, but I have a PhD in philosophy and I, I went to grad school in philosophy um, and I'm very interested in philosophy. Um, and I wrote a book about it um, called Does Santa Exist? Which is sort of about the philosophy of uh, faith and also comedy. Um, so if those interest you, um, you should check it out. Uh, you might like it. Where can they get it? Can they get it wherever books are sold? Or they yeah, wherever they're books? sold. I mean, certainly they can get it on the internet. Uh, yeah. Probably they can't get it wherever books are sold because uh, a lot of places where books are sold that don't have it in stock. But if you go on the internet, you can easily get it. Do you got a website you're selling it from? That way we can check I don't. It. I do not. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Just, just get it. Tell people to read it. Read it. I'm just hoping to get it out there. I don't know that it, it at this point um, financially helps me <laughs> in any way. But I do like the idea that people, people would read it because uh, I tried to do a good job writing it. So I would like people to enjoy it. Well, I'll tell you what, man, you got at least one earn from me because as soon as we get Great. off, I'm going to go ahead and buy it. Great. Um, uh, getting into this, uh, the fans questions. Now, we had quite a few. Ladies and gentlemen, I usually write them down in the book. But just on Reddit alone, there was about 120 or 130 questions. So I was not writing that many. My hands hurt enough. Um, so I figure what we'll do is we'll just skim through and we'll answer as, or we'll ask as many as you can. Uh, any of them you don't feel like answering or they don't feel uh, topical or you just don't want to answer, we can go skip. Why don't you give me a hamburger instead of carrots? Wait a second, that <laughs> question is from Ollie. It's not from one of the fans. Oh man, she spelled her name incorrectly on that question oh. mission too, so. That's a good joke, Ed says that my dog writes, but he spells so poorly. <laughs> That's the next episode next to the chicken, the, uh, the yeah. self-aware chicken. Yeah, the, the chicken, uh, the witch, and the wardrobe. <laughs> you going to animate it or is it live action? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it with, uh, with finger puppets. Yeah? Yeah. Animation. <laughs> yeah, I make, I'm making the finger puppets uh, out of old um, toilet paper rolls. And, and once I have used enough toilet paper for the because it's got a cast of thousands. Um, yeah. <laughs> once I've, I've used enough toilet paper to have enough rolls, we're going to start principal photography. <laughs> okay, Jump6656 wants to know. Hey, Jump6656, how you doing? Uh, my actual question is, which of the episodes that you wrote are your favorite and which overall episode is your favorite? So one that you wrote is your favorite and then one that somebody else might have written is your favorite. So my question is, my actual question, are there fake questions that Jump6656 has been putting forward up until this point? Maybe. Why, why, okay, but we're gonna answer Jump6656 actual question. <laughs> and is this specific to Futurama or just anything on the earth? Let's go one Futurama and then the one that you didn't write. We'll go non-Futurama for any TV oh, show. You have to but I'd like to do, I'd like to do, um, well, okay. Look, one that I didn't write was the pilot to Flight of the Concords, which I think is great. It's a great pilot. It's really funny. It creates a beautiful tone. It's terrific. Um, one that I did write, um, I enjoyed, um, I enjoyed the Futurama episode that I wrote. Um, oh, I'm gonna say I enjoyed the first season of Zombie College which yeah. is a show I did for the internet. Um, uh, and, and I'm gonna put it out there on the hopes that maybe someone will look on YouTube and look at it. <laughs> well, well, so it's a, slightly, uh, it's a slightly strategic answer. You know, I, I did like, I was gonna say hell is other robots, but I thought, why don't I say zombie college? So, so my answer is the pilot to Flood of the Concords and zombie college. Beautiful. And then uh, I forgot to say, uh, we'll put the link for your book in the description below so you guys can go and click on it and buy it as well as the link for uh, zombie college as well on um, that way you guys right and, and and both of them are safe for work so don't worry about it beautiful uh precarious 69 wants to know giggity hey, precarious uh, where do you keep your i wonder favorite? what the source of the precarity is maybe they're located on top of a a a cliff maybe that's a little bit of a joke anyway go on where do you keep your various lengths of wire I keep my various lengths of wire in a drawer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bunt Popcake, he didn't have a question, but uh, 
they didn't have a, a question. statement or a command. I know this from studying speech act theory with John Searle. If well, Bunch, he was just he was Bunch just Bunch has a command. He was just replying to precarious. He was saying, I've seen so many excellent questions in the comment section, but none is oh shit, that's a tough word. Scintillating as this Scintillating. one. Yeah, I need an answer to this question. So you got your answer. You got um, your answer. Um Bunch 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 cake, yeah. Bunch cake. Uh Hudson wants to know. I, I hope that's right. Uh, what were some of the cardinal rules you followed while writing the show? Were there certain givens that everyone understood and stuck by? Well, a funny answer to that question was one of the rules was no time travel, which was then <laughs> spectacularly broken. Um, so that was a strange rule. Um, I remember a rule was the professor is not does not perv on younger women. Mm -hmm. He can be callous and weird, but he's not pervy. I thought that was an interesting rule. Um, I think uh, this was perhaps a, I don't know if this was explicitly stated as a rule, um, but it had an element of, it was sort of a background understanding, excuse me. Which, thank you. Which was that uh, the story should be, they should work as science fiction. They shouldn't be goofy um, spoofs. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like Mel Brooks's Spaceballs. <laughs> like like they should work as if if they weren't funny, they would be good or at least serviceable science fiction stories. So I think that was a that was a background understanding. I don't know if it was ever formulated as a rule. Maybe it was honestly. Maybe it was, it was very congenial to me. Like I liked that. So, so I don't know that I necessarily had to be called into the principal's office about it ever, but uh, it, it was certainly our understanding set by David and Matt of what we were doing. Gotcha. Uh, throw away from me, 90, 90, 90. Why, did, from me, 90, 90, 90. why did they choose or not? Why did they, why did you choose to have the ending Jurassic Park be so sad? Don't get me wrong, it's powerful and bittersweet, but it's really sad and kind of ruined my day when I first saw it, LOL. So why did okay. you ruin this, guys? Well, I have, a, I have a, whole, a whole, I'm ready to preach on this one, man. <laughs> um, so one thing is I think there's a tendency or sometimes we feel like we don't like to feel painful things. Yeah. So in order to avoid feeling painful things, sometimes we adapt a strategy where we don't feel anything in order to avoid feeling the painful things. But this, in my view, is an understandable but mistaken strategy for life because it means you don't feel good things either. And then why are you even alive if you're not gonna feel good things or bad things? You might as well be dead. So yeah. I think, um, it's very easy and maybe more easy for the male gender, but maybe everybody has their strategy to go through life numbed. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, um, I'll just call it art. One of the things that art can do is what Kafka called, it can be an ax to break open the frozen lake of the soul. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that art can do is it can counteract this tendency, which we get from ourselves and we get from our family and we get from our culture and blah, 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 to numb out. Um, and one of the things art can do is it can make you feel your feelings and notice your feelings. And that can make you a more self-aware person. And it can also sort of lead to you not missing out on your life, <laughs> you know, because if you're numbed out, it's like you're not even there for your own life. So that's why I'm okay with art that causes people to feel emotional pain because i think it's it's even like even like if you think about if you're if if your leg falls asleep the initial feeling of their your leg coming back to sleep awake is is uncomfortable oh, yeah. but it's a discomfort that we like you know because it, it at the end of it we're more in our body we're more aware of our lives so so i i think that's that's why um and the point of this particular one was that sometimes people through no fault of their own miss out on love. They come up with a story 
about why they're not going to accept love in their lives or they're not going to connect with someone who's out there hoping to connect. And that story can be very plausible as Fry's story was very plausible, but wrong. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the moral of this less of this show. Um, I, like most of my shows, I think don't have morals that you can state quite as neatly as that, but this one does. And that's the moral that sometimes you can come up with a story uh, about why you should avoid love that's plausible, but wrong. That, and so therefore it kind of means if you're thinking about whether to go for it, like some, you know, should I have a child? Should I marry this person who likes me? And you're like, I wanna be 100% sure that I won't make a mistake. You're kidding yourself. You will never be 100% sure you won't make a mistake. Um, and that's sort of another like ancillary moral that there's no way Fry could have been 100% sure he wasn't making a mistake. Um, and in this case, he was making a mistake. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a little less succinct as I continue answering this question, but that's the answer to the question. Uh, there's a response to this one, zero, zero, I think. Uh, sure, sure. And did they have the narwhal back in the time idea already planned to give Seymour a better ending? I'm not really sure what he means by that. I'm assuming a later the episode. Narwhal back in the time idea. Yeah. That sounds to me like something that must have happened on the show after I left it. Okay. And if that's true, which I think it is, just sort of a little Sherlock Holmesian deduction on my part, we didn't have that idea. <laughs> we had no, when I was writing and when we were writing Jurassic Bark, there was no narwhal involved. Okay. It was a narwhal free episode. And, and then, by the way, that's one of the many ways in which it's, it's, it has something in common with the movie Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. Also, utterly lacking narwhals. And I think Godfather 2, um, although maybe there are people out there who know that film better than I do, but I don't think there's any narwhals in those three, three uh, films, uh, or one of them is the TV show, narwhal free. Uh, <laughs> Man, I should have scrolled down just a little bit further and I would have seen what you just beautifully put as far as art. Uh, somebody got to it as well. Uh, that's called Art Fam, and that was by F underscore C K Y O underscore. So I can only imagine he's trying that's to buy a letter U. That's a hard handle to pronounce. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm... Narwhals on Parade has narwhals. Um, big narwhal of 1938 <laughs> has a, nar a narwhal, Busby Berkeley. Now, <laughs> now here's a question for the readers to work out at home. If you're writing a parody of a Busby Berkeley musical about narwhals, as Big Narwhal of 1938 clearly is. <laughs> Does that mean the narwhal must do a dance on the ground, on the on the land, because the Busby Berkeley musicals had human women doing dances in the water? Do you have to switch it like that? Or is it okay in these troubled times to make the big narwhal of 1938 parody have a narwhal doing a dance like a Busby Berkeley musical in a pool? I'll leave that for the readers to work out at home at their desks and they can mail them to, uh, to Ollie uh, care of your, your address and, and please include a snack. Thank you. <laughs> uh, where are we at here? Uh, Fox McLeod wants to know, I got to talk to him a few years back. I asked him what Narcotonia, shit. Narcotina. Yeah. Narcotina was supposed to be just a throwaway, throwaway idea or uh, of an intense future coffee. Um, so I don't really know if he's- And I answered it. Why is he coming back? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then Denton USA right underneath it, he said, holy shit, thank you. So there's some interesting shit out here. Uh, uh, well, I, will, I will, this is an obscure point. I do remember my conversation with Fox McLeod. And the point is in the DVD, uh, closed captioning, the line freshen your narcotina was not transcribed. And, and people were like, what's she saying? And it sounds like narcotina. So mm -hmm. there were people, and it's probably was Fox McLeod who contacted me and said, what on earth is that? And I said, it's freshen your narcotina. 
And they were like, oh, cool, thanks. Um, and, and then they were like, oh, what does that mean? And I said, well, it's about a, a future world where um, uh, some kind of other legal drug is accepted in the same way that like caffeine is accepted in our society in this future world, some kind of combination of Ovaltine and narcotics is accepted and it's called Nargadina. Um, so that's the joke. Um, and uh, and uh, that's the answer. And uh, hi, Fox McLeod. And I'm glad our, our space time worms have crossed a second time. Beautiful. Uh, how does it feel to have been a part of the most highly educated writer's room in television history? That's well, good. Uh, you know, I like learning. I like to learn things. Um, it was also sort of fun that I didn't need to worry that if I reference something like that, you, that you learn from reading a book that everyone would be like, oh, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to like let my nerd flag fly um, because I was surrounded by my own people. Uh, so it felt good. That's a t-shirt for the website I hope you start is you pointing at the camera and screaming nerd. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and I got to agree with this guy. You might be one of these smart. And then I don't want any of my other guests, previous or future guests, to think that I think they're dumb. But you got to be one of the most articulate and smart. I'm going to sound dumb as shit because I'm not that smart. But you're one of the smartest people I've ever had on here, man. Oh, so thanks, I really man. appreciate this conversation. That's kind of you. <clears throat> Where are we here? Uh, ooh, Roach 1984 wants to know, what percentage of zinc are you? I don't know. Well, James Jimmy 6969 says you're 40%. How do you feel about that? I think it's probably inaccurate. <laughs> I, I don't feel strongly about zinc 9969 being inaccurate about the percentage of zinc I am since I don't know him. Uh, I suspect he's probably making a joke, so it doesn't it doesn't elicit a lot of powerful emotions from me. But I I will just for the sake of of uh, pedantry say I think it's probably untrue. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Uh, why Fry and why not Zoidberg? I'm <laughs> well, I think that's a joke. Uh, so so uh, I don't know why not Zoidberg. I'm going to have to just echo it. Beautiful. We'll go from there. Maybe he'll uh, see this and he'll write back in. Um, we can skip this one if you want. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Is it extremely profane? Not really, but we talked about it. Pornographic? No, we talked about it a little bit before we hit record. Did ask uh, about parts of my body that are normally covered by a bathing suit? No. But I don't want to discuss that. <laughs> Some Tin Funny wants to know, yeah. what episodes are in... What episodes, in your opinion, are the high and low of the series and why? Well, I mean, we don't want I to am certainly it. not going to criticize any other writer's episode by saying it's a low of the series. Yeah. That would be that would be unsportsmanlike and uncool. Um, yeah. Which are the high? I really like the Farnsworth Parabox, honestly. I, I get a real thrill out of that one because it's so funny, but also so conceptually clear. Mm -hmm. uh, that I really enjoy that. Um, so that's really, that's a really solid, like a really good episode um, by Bill Odenkirk. Um, I think uh, Ron Weiner's episode, The Why of Fry mm -hmm. is extremely good. Um, I'm gonna say those, but, but you know, there's, 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 there's precious emeralds and rubies in all the episodes of Futurama, so. 100% uh sci vibes wants to know uh, what's your favorite subtle joke gag or background feature that we might have missed okay i'll tell you one that i like i don't know if it's my favorite but i can, it can recall which is um at some point a race of evil brains are trying to bring an end to the quest for knowledge by demolishing all facts one by one mm -hmm. and one of the facts that they demolish, it says something like 17 is greater than five. And this is a joke about the ontology of facts, because if you think about it, there are an infinite, there's an uncountably infinite number of facts like that. So you could never destroy all facts by putting them in a row and having doing 17 is greater than five, 
because clearly there's another one, which is 17 is greater than four, 17 is greater than three. There's an infinite number of facts like that one. So you will never be able to destroy all facts by putting them in a row going down a conveyor belt. <laughs> so, so I like that joke because I had, when I was in grad school, one of my, um, I, I had to do a thing called an oral exam where uh, four tough professors would pepper me with questions about three topics. And one of my topics was about the ontology of facts. Um, so, so that's a subtle thing that I think may have skated by many a viewer who doesn't think about these things. And, and I'm not suggesting, don't get me wrong, that they should. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying they should be thinking about them, but they might miss it if they're not thinking about it. Quantum Time Loop wants to know. Quantum Time Loop. Hi, Quantum Time Loop. Did you know the show would be so accurate to today's society? If so... <laughs> Is it accurate to today's society? <laughs> I don't see any walking, talking robots going down the street, much less going into suicide booths. I, I don't know. <laughs> I find that a strange question. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to challenge one of the uh, presuppositions of the question. Okay. Well, his second part is null and void then. Cause if, so, second point? if second point? so, what made you realize it was going this route? Um, oh yeah. I find it's a strange thing. I don't think Futurama is terribly, is, is a, a great prediction of life in 2022. I don't know, man. I mean, I'm sorry I can't play ball with that one. Maybe if I thought more about exactly exactly what feature, um, what's his name, Quant Loop? Uh, quantum Time Loop. Quantum Time Loop, yeah. I would be curious to know what Quantum Time Loop um, is referring to, to answer that question. Oh, I'll tell you another joke that I liked, because I think it was the first joke I ever got in Futurama, um, which is while Fry is frozen in the Rose tube. Mm -hmm. We see a montage of history. And that history includes an invasion by flying saucers that destroys New York. And then the construction of another city that looks the same out of medieval castles. And that was my pitch. And then it's destroyed by another team, another invasion of flying saucers. And this is a reference to the Scienza Nuova of Gian Battista Vico, who uh, believes that history is cyclical. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's also a reference to Ibn Khaldun, but I was not familiar with Ibn Khaldun at that stage in my wayward youth. Um, but that's a, that's a background joke, which I think uh, I enjoy because it's, it's sentimentally important to me. It's the first joke I got in. Um, and, uh, and people might miss it. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting, this issue of, uh, of cyclic history. Got you. Uh, where are we at? Who was your favorite character to write? Was there oh, one? Zoidberg. About... Zoidberg. 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 Yeah. What made him so fun? I know well, it's a stupid question. He's like, a, he's he's like a talking lobster man. Yeah. Uh, and and that makes a character fun. In fact, when I I had a meeting with uh, David and Matt. I think it was in the Fox Commissary and they had boards with the designs of the different characters and they there was a pile and they were going through them and I was like wait a second show me that one <laughs> and that was Dr. Zoidberg um so I like a, I like him as a his a talking lobster man humanoid yeah I had a I had Billy West on uh last year what did he have to say oh man he 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 said that working on Futurama and most people will not go and say, hey, this was my favorite. This is my least favorite. Billy was one of the most open guests I've ever had. He said that was the most fun I have ever had on anything I have ever done. Amazing. He that, yeah, he said he said the right from the writing, the animation to the voice acting to everything made that a special and perfect show. And then I think I haven't had too many people on. I think it's only just you and, and Billy so far, as far as Futurama goes. Um, I've had, you know, a few people on from The Simpsons and King of the Hill and stuff like that. But as far as, as that era and that style of show, I haven't had too many of you guys and gals on yet. Um, but the two people that I've, well, I got to assume, what would you say was that probably one of the most fun times or was that the most Absolutely. fun? Absolutely. Absolutely. I really liked it. And one of the things I really loved about it was it was really written from a point of view of love. 
we were really writing stuff that we loved that we wanted to do and and i think in some kind of schmoopy way the audience picks up on that that the audience is like this is something that's written from a pure place rather than from a transactional place rather it's not a trying to trick you into watching <laughs> it's not a cash grab for sure it's not, uh, you have yeah. heart and soul to it yeah um, favorite truck stop sandwich fouling's fist wants to know oh yeah worm egg uh improvement worm egg sandwich no question and then root my lands wrote in right after favorite truck stop sandwich was put and he said the sandwich heavy portfolio wins again it, um, it sure does yeah, Oomph the God wants to know, uh, should Bender be allowed on television? Should Bender be allowed on television? Yes, although it seems that television might be going away. So we might need to ask, should Bender be allowed to be streamed? Um, what do you think? And, and, you know, considering that urine is allowed to be streamed, <laughs> I would say Bender is at least as good as urine, so he should be allowed to be streamed as well. I mean, urine does stream. When it comes it, out, it better so. be allowed to be streamed or you must go and speak seek a urologist quick <laughs> oh um and that sound you just made is a sound you'll make when it's allowed to be streamed <laughs> uh, pandemonia wants to know uh, would he be ready and willing now i, I asked you this uh, on he Twitter. me huh he me yes you would he be willing and ready? Yeah, I asked you this on Twitter. Um, would you be willing and ready to do more episodes? And I guess that this was done a while ago. Um, if the reboot happens, the reboot is happening. If so, mm -hmm. ideas for said episodes. Oh, do I have ideas for the episodes? Yes, and then would you be willing? Well, I'm not willing? working on the reboot. Mm -hmm. So it would be um, rude. <laughs> of me to be pitching ideas because there's a talented staff of writers who are writing that season right now so, yeah. so it's rude of me to pitch ideas um and truthfully if you're fascinated or interested in the reboot you should have somebody involved in the reboot on to discuss it rather than me um i'd be happy to be on it with them if they want to have me on but but it's not it's it's like it's it's a little bit obnoxious of me to be getting to people to pay attention to me in reference to the reboot because i'm not working on it yeah <laughs> so, so that's a david x cohen uh question rather than an eric l kaplan question there you go pandemonium 1738 um london ripton wants to know seeing as how episodes like jurassic park and parasites lost are very emotional character driven episodes what strategies does eric employ to better understand the characters he's writing a different question is who was his favorite character to write for? We already answered that one. Yeah, so uh, are there strategies that you employ to better understand the characters you're writing? Well, I think we always are and ought to be trying to understand everybody who we run into. Mm -hmm. And and the strategy is to kind of catch yourself if your own psychological shit is getting in the way of understanding other people. Like, for example, if you're like, like the Madonna whore complex, right? That, that all women are either good or bad. Well, that's not true. That's not understanding women. That's understanding what you want from women or what you hope from women or what you fear about women if you're a man, but you're not actually understanding women. So if you are finding that you're not understanding people because of your own personal hopes and fears, <laughs> be very general, your hopes and fears about other people means you don't know what it's like for them to be them, you better cut that out. Yeah, <laughs> stop doing that <laughs> and try and understand what it's like to be a woman or a uh, a person of a different race or you know a man if you're a woman or you know or a, a child if it's been a long time since you've been a child or a, you know a professor if you're not a professor like like you need to sort of if you're going to be a writer start to get your own self out of the way and start to 
emotionally connect with what other people are like. Um, and, and, and the irony or the funny thing about it is very often it involves mapping them onto you so that you're sort of like, I've been afraid. I've never, I've never been in the Navy, but I'd imagine when you were in the Navy, there must have been times when you were afraid. So if I'm trying to write your character, I deal with that. Or I've, I've, jo I've never joined the armed forces, but I've joined other groups where I want to be accepted. And, and so that's how I would write my way. I mean, of course, I would talk to you and I'd read books by people who are in the Navy. But, but sort of the main thing is to sort of think like, well, here's a living, breathing, suffering human being. They, they, they want safety. They want love. They want to be seen. Um, they want to be accepted. Uh, you know, uh, they have a desire for fun. They have a desire for new things. You know, everybody has certain similarities. And then you kind of like write your way into this other person, I would say. Yeah, it really, really goes to show, man. Step into somebody's shoes and actually live in that person's shoes and then go from there. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Gustav Flaubert said uh, he wrote this this great book, one of the great novels of Madame Bovary about a woman uh, uh, who's who's married to a man and has an affair and she reads too many books and stuff like this. And he says, how, well, how did you write that? And he says, because Madame Bovary is me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, but well, you're a man. Well, OK, that's that's part of the magic of it, that he's able to see the commonality between him and a sort of provincial slightly boring woman who has an affair you know it's shocking at the time like oh my goodness isn't she a bad person you know yeah so so it's yeah it is sort of making that imaginative connection with other people which to my mind it, it a lot of it has to do with looking at the things that are preventing you from imaginatively connecting with other people and and neutralizing them rather than an active project um yeah, i got you yeah. um <clears throat> excuse me could be true uh sorry for the delay here ladies and gentlemen just looking through here gotta kind of read some of these before i, I put can do there. eyebrow exercises you can <laughs> use at home as well the left um, eyebrow muscles what is oh, man no oh, we already answered that one so uh homer nar wants to say no questions please just say thank you from me so homer nar wants to say thank you oh you're welcome homer nar <laughs> Hannibal Thanks. Rex wants to know Parasite Lost is amazing but my question is about Jurassic Park uh, man this is a backhanded compliment how does he feel about writing the most skipped episode I can't imagine that's the most skipped episode that episode is phenomenal and like you said back then you're supposed to feel happiness and you're supposed to feel sadness um, some of these people are just a little rude I, I'm not my feelings are not hurt um, I don't think you need to watch something over and over again for it to have the result. If you yeah. watch it once and it had an effect on you, I'm happy. You don't have to spend your brief time on Earth watching it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you could read or watch something else. That's perfectly OK. Um, if you're skipping it, if you've never watched it because someone has told you you won't like it, um, I, I don't, and you, and you like Futurama, uh, you should probably watch it because you'll like it. <laughs> it's, it's a phenomenal episode. You're supposed, like you said earlier, you're supposed to feel happiness. You're supposed to feel, you ever see the movie? Uh, oh shit. What is it? Um, the Pixar Godzilla movie. versus the smog monster. No, uh, it's the no. Pixar movie, uh, inside out. You ever seen that? One? Oh, I love that movie. Oh, I think that movie is, is a, a stunning work of art. Uh, 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 about on the level of like a, a medieval cathedral. And I really mean that because I think it's motivated by a deep spiritual take on human life. And it is the collaborative fruit, the fruit of a collaboration of hundreds of extremely skilled artists. Yeah. So I, I think that movie is, it makes me proud to be a human. Yeah. I think it's so good. It, it really is. And watching that good piece of art, watching that as a dad and having two kids, one 12 and one eight months old. Mm -hmm. um, you, for me, I don't want to put any words into anybody's mouth, but for me specifically, I look at that and you think 
man, I don't want my kid to feel sadness, just like she didn't want her herself to feel sadness. It's the same thing. If you could take somebody's pain away, right? You want to take that pain away, but then you you realize if you take that pain away, you're taking people's experiences away. You know, I've I, in a long or a short way of saying this, I've learned more by fucking up than I ever have crushing it the first time out of the park, right? So I loved how I could watch that and feel different ways at different times, if that makes any sense at all. Like looking at it as a dad, I would feel one way, but I was like, if I, if I didn't have any kids and if I was a single, single bachelor type of dude, I would feel this way because I wouldn't want my friends or, or my family members to feel sadness. I mean, I'm pretty sure you got a better and a more articulate yeah, I think way you've of expressed thinking. that very lucidly. I yeah. agree with that. I agree with that. So, but yeah, it was, uh, that was, uh, one movie that I absolutely loved and, you know, your point earlier just, you know, nailed it home, right? So you got to have the good if you got to have the bad, or you got to have the bad to have the good, you know? Yeah, so. Sunshine is, you know, if, if we had sunshine every single day, it would feel normal, right? But we have those days where it rains, you're like, oh shit, we're supposed to feel nice in the sunshine. Yeah. So, um, every day a holiday to sport would be as tedious as to work, but when they seldom come, they wish for come. It is. <laughs> That is Henry IV talking to his son, Prince Hal. And I wish I wish I knew what holidays were in the workforce now. Working in the kitchen, man. Oh, Christmas, Christmas Eve, Thanksgiving. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it sucks. I had more days off when I was in the military, if that makes any sense. The first four years of my oldest were you, the, were you the ship cook? No, I wasn't. I, I <laughs> This is going to sound fucked up and it's not a, it's not a, it's not a backhanded compliment to any of the Navy cooks. When I signed in, that's what I wanted to do. I saw Steven Seagal in under siege and I was like, holy shit, you could be a badass and you can cook. <laughs> Sign me the fuck up. And then at 12 years old, I saw a little show called Emerald live. And this guy had everybody captivated like a rock star. He was a magician up there. He had everybody paying attention to what he was doing just by playing with food and making funny sounds and fucking throwing bam spices all over the place or Emerald essence. So I had this idea of like, I wanted to be a cook when I, and I want to go to the Navy. I had an uncle that was an army, older brother was a Marine Corps. They're like, you're too nice of a kid. Do not fucking join the Marine Corps. Do not join the army. We do not want to see you come home in a box. So I was like, cool, man, let me join the Navy. I go there, do my ASVAB, which is the test they, they give you to go in to figure out what job you're going to do. And I was like, <clears throat> I want to be a cook, excuse me. I want to be a cook. And they're like, you're way too smart to be a cook. You scored way too high to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, I still want to be a cook. So and, what did they uh, make you do? Uh, I was a supply guy. So picture FedEx and Walmart wrapped into one. That's what I did. I was everybody's best friend. We were one of five sections or five groups of people in the, in mili in the military force or in the Navy uh, that everybody loved. You never fucked with a supply guy. You never fucked with a cook. You never, ever, ever mess with the IT guy because they could take your internet away. You never made, uh, you never mess with the PSs, which was your, um, your, oh, fuck, what are they? Your uh, money people. Yeah, yeah, they were, yeah, they were administration, they were PSs and yeomans and stuff like that. And there was one, oh, and the medical. You never fucked with the docs because they're the ones that stick you with needles and you want to make sure they're nice about it. Right, so. right. But, yeah, so I don't know why. What was your, what was your favorite um, place to take leave? When I was deployed? Like, yeah. favorite place to go see? Uh, there was this beautiful island. I think it's off of the west coast of Africa. Absolutely gorgeous. It's called Seychelles. It is... Oh, yeah. When I was there, and I don't know how true this is, and I haven't fact-checked it, but there was a huge, like, European... Everybody that was there said this is the European Hawaii, if that makes any sense. Like what we look at as Hawaii, the Europeans looked at Seychelles as Hawaii. So it, we got there. It was beautiful food. It was it was amazing people. Um, I'd never seen just a city like that. I mean, it wasn't anything crazy, but it was just it was so much different. And first time I ever went overseas, I was 17 before I joined the military. 17 and I went to Italy so it changed my whole perspective on what culture is what people are what we do for a living just how people live there to how people live here what they have for values and what we have for values and kind of how they intersect and how we we're a melting pot you know the United States is a melting pot we're a place full of immigrants that came yeah. here and settled and fucking sprouted roots and shit and we started growing so it was crazy seeing just a different way of people living at such a young age that completely changed how i looked at not only food that was the hugest part of, of wanting to be a chef even more so was just seeing how they treated food 
and how food brought everybody together at the table. I mean, their tables were so big because they would sit down and it wasn't like us. You have your one little plate and then that's what you do. People guard their plate type of thing. You go over there and everybody's, you know, sharing a plate. Like there'd be 17 or 18 different dishes passed around like, oh shit, you got to try this, try this, try that, try this, try that. And it was so interesting. It was so mind blowing at such a young age, just seeing all of that shit. Um, and like I said, joining the Navy and hitting Seychelles, that was probably one of my favorite places. Cool. So, yeah. By the way, <clears throat> in my animation career, I worked with somebody as a voiceover talent who was the ship cook mm -hmm. in the Pacific Theater in World War II. Really? Yeah. Harry Dean Stanton. Harry Dean Stanton. Um, I, I'd hate to ask, is he still around? Do you know? He's not. No, he passed away about two years ago. And he lived a long time. He lived into his late 80s and he smoked cigarettes a lot. Yeah. And he claimed that he didn't have the gene that that make you become ill if you smoke cigarettes. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder if right. I think that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Dorks double zero double oh one wants to know. Um, in your opinion, who's a better captain, Picard or Kirk? You know, I I certainly understand the Picard argument, which is that the captain of the ship should not be going down mm -hmm. with the search party. So I would have to say that from a rational point of view, Picard, but from an emotional point of view, I grew up on TOS and I never really cottoned to next gen. So for me, Kirk is not just the better captain, he's sort of the only captain. Gotcha. Um, uh, tell him Jake, Jake Lopian, I think. Jake so Lopian. Tell him I love Tears in Heaven, brilliant song. Okay. Oh, I, I get that. That's a joke that has dogged me since the age of 12. Yeah. You, you get the joke, right? I do not know. The joke is that Eric Kaplan sounds a little bit like Eric Clapton. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> this is the joke that I'm quite familiar with. Um, this one's a fun one. G unit one 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 wants to know. Unit one 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 one. Why don't they make more suppositories? How many more G unit one 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 one? How many more will it take to, to satisfy you? At least one more. I don't know. <laughs> uh, ask him, the person deleted their name. Well, their name much might be deleted. I don't know. Ask him, is it canon that Seymour lived with Lars? Tell me it's canon. Tell me Seymour living with Fry when he traveled back is canon. I must know. I'm not going to answer any questions about... Um, the post Jurassic Bark adventures of Seymour because I is. don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I wasn't involved in that uh, epoch of Futurama. Gotcha. Now, I always tell people I'm not a, uh, what's the word? I'm not an expert on Eric. I'm not even an expert on Julian. Uh, I'm just fans of what you did. So, are if, you uh, named after the apostate? No, <clears throat> my mom told me I was named uh, when I was, they, they, she said we were undecided or they were undecided on a name. So apparently uh, when I was born in 1989, August 13th, 1989, um, there was a news article that she had read uh, in the newspaper, you know, either a few weeks before or maybe a month or two before I was born. And it was right when the mafia was starting to get seriously downsized by the, uh, by the FBI, right? With the Rico yeah. Act and all that other shit. Yeah. Uh, and then she saw the name Julian in there. And she was like, I always liked that name. And then I figured, yeah, that was a good name. And then, you know, the first book, and we're getting so far off topic here with this one, but the first book, I always wanted to be in the mafia when I was younger. I was real young and my grandfather was such a great fucking dude. Uh, he, he was, he was the guy that kind of instilled into me on looking at the credits type of thing when it came to movies or cartoons and shit like that pop culture, mm -hmm. because yeah. we would watch like his favorite channel was Turner classic movies. And he would sit there and be like, Hey, you know, that this lady did this and she was in this and he did this yeah. and he did that. Right. So it would just broaden my horizon when it came to this shit. Yeah. 
And we were sitting down watching Goodfellas. And for the longest time, I thought Goodfellas was just the opening, right? Where he's talking about how he always wanted to be in the mafia because they wore nice suits. They always played dominoes. They ate great food. And nobody fucked with them. So that's when my grandpa would cut the movie off, essentially. I wouldn't see the rest. I'm five or six years old at the time, right? So that's all I knew of Goodfellas and the mafia was like they got to eat really cool food. They right. got to do games and then nobody fucked with them. I was like, I that's want those three things, that. you know? Well, as they're going to fuck with each other, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't find that out until I was about 12 or 13, right? So it had this huge fascination in the mafia. And I loved yeah. The Godfather, right? One of my favorite movies still to this day of all time is The Godfather Part One. And the whole reason I took Italian in high school was so I could watch The Godfather without watching in subtitles, right? So I'm watching this and I was like, you know, I need to learn more about this, this group I want to be a part of. This is before really we had the internet. I mean, we had the internet, but I wasn't really on it. I was playing basketball at the time. I was reading comic books. I didn't really give a shit about the internet. We didn't even really have a computer. So I go on like, mom, hey, can we go to the bookstore? And she's like, oh my God, my son wants to read. He doesn't read anything that doesn't have pictures in it. Yeah, let's go to the bookstore. So we go to Books a Million. John Gotti had just released his autobiography, right? Uh-huh mom didn't realize what i picked up she just saw me pick up a big book and it was that fucking thick and she's like oh he's reading he's going to be something he's going to have a higher gpa now right, so right. i slide it in underneath my brother's books and my sister's books doesn't think nothing of it she gives the lady the cash we go and i'm reading i'm in the back seat of the truck mom what's a colombian necktie and she looks back she's like what the fuck are you talking about a colombian necktie and i was like i don't know what's in this book and she's like what the fuck are you reading and i'm like uh the john Gotti book you just bought me why the fuck are you reading a john Gotti book and i'm like uh, you told me to get a book that i liked or something that i wanted to read uh, about. this yeah, is what yeah. i wanted to read about and she was she took the book she took the book i never got to get the book back she took it and i'm pretty sure she either took it back to the store or she just uh, it. Right, so for the longest time i didn't really know what a colombian necktie was right so, right but now you do now i do now i do now i know it's a good thing not to be in the mafia and if you're in the mafia yeah, no, listen don't. This, please don't come after me so yeah I don't come after you. Julian. He's a good yes. guy. Yeah, I try to be. Thank you. Um, one armed gamer six 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 wants to know uh, where can I go for quality carpets? Oh, Kaplan's. You can go to Kaplan's for quality carpets. I'm ass- I'm assuming Eric Clapton and Kaplan carpets or something that have plagued you for your entire life. No, Kaplan Carpets, that's just a joke. I think David Cohen decided to call it. I, I, they, that was the same joke, actually, that I referenced with like 17 is greater than five, that the, just oh, the, okay. notion, the notion of a, a countable list of facts <laughs> is absurd. Um, no, the, the, the other Kaplan joke, there were, there were two Kaplan things that I was, I was not, not teased, but you know, that were jokes that were made. Um, one was there was a big sign in around 42nd Street that said Kaplan buys diamonds <laughs> for a different Kaplan. I yeah. don't buy diamonds, but people would say, oh, do you buy diamonds? Does your father buy diamonds? Um, and I would say, no, uh, it's one of those jokes which doesn't really, it's hard. I, I don't know a funny answer to it. Um, <laughs> and then there was also the Kaplan prep service. Stanley Kaplan's prep service mm-hmm. was another Kaplan, Gabe Kaplan. Star Welcome Back Cotter is a Kaplan. Uh, Mordecai Kaplan, founder of the um, uh, Reconstructionist uh, branch of Judaism. Um, there's a, an urban legend, but I don't think it's true that Charlie Chaplin's original name was Charlie Kaplan. Um, really? Yeah, I don't think it's true. So not really. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, there's Kaplan's. Kaplan is, it, it just means um, it's, it's, a, it's another Eastern European variant of Cohen. Mm-hmm. It means that uh, you're a member of the priestly caste, which I am. Nice. Um, last one from Reddit here. Uh, yeah. Root my lands, I think. Root my lands. Why do I have to be 160 years old to rent ultra porn? 169 seems much more appropriate. Well, this is a childish joke, uh, and I, I, I have to think that maybe you're a youthful person or youthful at heart, so you're clearly not old enough to rent ultra porn. Uh, you're going to have to keep yourself aroused by consuming mega porn, but not ultra porn. Sorry. 
So uh, Cameron here, uh, I really enjoy when Cameron writes questions in. Uh, he's very thoughtful. Um, how often did you experience writer's block with Futurama? Uh, uh, well, you know, God forbid, never. I've never experienced writer's block. Nice. However. Oh, I thought you were coming in closer to say however. <laughs> no. Okay, got you. <laughs> no, I'm just nervously moving back and forth in my seat. It's not it's not preparatory to some great revelation, unfortunately. Uh, how would you describe your, same thing from, uh, same, same person here. How oh, would you describe your relationship with the Futurama voice actors? How much of a role have they played in inspiring slash enhancing the writing process? Uh, they're great. I like them and I have a lot of respect for them. And they have played a huge role in inspiring and enhancing the writing process because they've taught us what these characters sound like. <laughs> you know, they've embodied the characters. So they kind of go from ideas to real people. And once you know what Dr. Zoidberg sounds like, what Bender sounds like, uh, they become much easier to write for. Um, so they are revealing the characters to us through their performances as we are revealing the characters to them through our writing. And then of course the, the character designers and the directors are also doing it. It's quite lovely. It's a lovely dance. Uh, uh, it's a lovely square dance of space cartooning. Beautiful. Uh, G Rex here uh, yeah. says, oh, hey, I was just reading about a man who died diving into a hot spring after his friend's dog and it's instantly reminded me of Jurassic Park but couldn't find any source indicating it was the inspiration. I'd love to find out. It was not the inspiration because I have not heard that story until this moment. Beautiful. All right, here we are switching over. We Barring just... any sort of odd temporal causality, uh, it could not be the inspiration. Beautiful. Uh, and we actually, I think we had one about the zombie college. Oh, good. Just had it pulled up here. There we go. You all two comments. Oh, um, it was actually by somebody that worked with you. Um, shit, I lost my train of thought here. Um, I just had him on to Dan Cunningham. Excuse me. I don't know why I blanked. Oh, Dan great man. Dan yeah. Cunningham is a great man. Dave Cunningham. Uh, Dave, Dave, Dave Cunningham. Cunningham. Dave Cunningham. Uh, Dave Cunningham. You want to know why I said Dan? Dan Cunningham was my old sous chef. He passed away last year. Oh, I'm sure to hear that. About seven, eight months ago. And whenever I see the name Cunningham, I instantly think of Dan, Dan, the, the Cunningham. We, it was funny. I'm going to tell you a Dan Cunningham story, even though you didn't know him. Uh, so <clears throat> Dan was a super, super hardcore punk rocker, right? Cool dude, weird dude, but fun dude, right? Yeah. So he came in one day and or he was he was coming in late, right? So he sends me a text. He's like, uh, hey man, I'm running a little bit behind. My truck's on fire. That's all he sent me. And I was like, dot, dot, dot. There seems like there should be more context to this text that you just sent me. Do you need help? Yeah. Didn't, yeah, yeah. Hear, didn't hear nothing from him for a couple hours. So he had this old Toyota truck that I believe was his dad's or it might have been his grandfather's. I can't remember which one, but it's this old Toyota truck, his tan Toyota truck. So I smelt it before I saw it, right? <laughs> Something rolled up smelling burnt. So I was outside getting some stuff from the freezer because with the restaurant I was working at, they had a freezer on the outside. <clears throat> so I just smelt something burning. I'm like, oh shit, I left something on the stove in there. So I'm running out and then I see him backing his truck in and the entire front hood or the, the entire hood of his truck was burnt to shit. I guess he had gotten into it uh, with, with the roommate. The roommate lost his shit and lit his truck on fire. Oh, it was arson. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, oh. some, yeah, somebody lit his truck on fire. His his, uh, oh. his roommate. Um, I don't I don't know what happened after that, but I did find out that if somebody gets their truck or anything lit on fire and you call them Dan the fireman, they do not appreciate that as oh, much as you think they would do. Right. Right. One of those asymmetries about humor where it's funnier to the person making the joke than the person <laughs> about whom the joke is made that those do do occur yes they yeah. do and then taking it one step further and photoshopping him into a firefighter's costume was he not a fun yeah he, he didn't yeah. i thought it was funny dan i miss you man 
Um, but uh, Dave Cunningham says, uh, Eric is a great guy and a superstar talent. Worked with him on Futuramba and Zombie Challenge. So it really wasn't a, uh, or Zombie College, excuse me. Um, yeah, so he, he worked with the- Zombie only- Challenge is not a bad idea for a show, by the way. Maybe it's a prequel. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take Zombie Challenge. I'll make sure I get the website for you and I'll gift yeah, that to the next challenge. year for your birthday. Totally. Um, challenge. Moy underscore tunes. Uh, anyway, I, I, I back at you, Dave Cunningham. You're a great artist and a great man. Moy, Moy tunes wanted to say he's a, he's a fellow animator. Well, I'm not a, I'm not an animator, but he's an animator. He said, uh, do you do a lot of research on a topic before writing a script? Like the joke about physics and measuring that a real physicist appreciated and re- reacted to on YouTube. Well, so um, the the notion that certain um, certain physical quantities change when you measure them is a very profound discovery of quantum mechanics, and it uh, interested me. But I to be honest, knew about it before, <laughs> before yeah. I went to work for Futurama. But the, in, I, don't, I don't mean to be a jerk or anything, but I didn't know about it before, so I didn't need to research that. But I will certainly research stuff a lot, you know, um, a lot, uh, uh, sure, because it's, it's I'll research things by reading, I'll research things by talking to people, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, you, you, people's lives have a lot of thickness to them. People's lives have a lot of detail. And you will always be thin compared to reality. <laughs> you know, like in the same sense that if you are a painter, you'll see them, they are painting real things. that <laughs> They will go and look at a cauliflower and paint it because the cauliflower has more to it than our conception of a cauliflower. And that's the same thing with a like a chef, like I can imagine what a chef is like and be like, well, you must be stressed and you know, you must care about food and you, you know, all that. You must have feelings about the customers that you don't share with the customers. All that stuff is true, but it pales behind what I would learn if I spent two weeks following a chef or I spoke to chefs, you know, so you got to research. So research chef, is um, challenge, is that the next show? Um, be, uh, be challenge. Nar- narwhal, narwhal chef. By the way, where is the restaurant, Julian? Which one? Mine? I don't, work have, I don't oh. have one. I, uh, I work at one. Uh, okay. And we're back. I work at a You're restaurant. about Norwales. <laughs> I work at a Norwal restaurant. I don't know that a Norwal originally etymologically means nose well. Mm-hmm. But if any of those people who didn't know that were listening, they're not those people anymore because now they're the people who do know that. <laughs> uh that should be that should be your next show man you want to write a show about norwals oh do i ever or do you like oats yeah <laughs> all right last one here this this comes from a D buddy here uh, okay. uh, well actually there's two more and both of them come from my uh my D buddies oh you're uh, garrett wants to know um garrett. did you prefer writing more comedic content or more serious content I like writing comedic content. Yeah. I like, I like it when people laugh. All right. And then last one here. And this is uh, this is my buddy Shane. Um, were you a fan of Futurama before you wrote your first episode? I, I don't know when, you, I can't remember when you came on. I you- joined before there was a first episode. So okay. I was writing on the show from the beginning. Um, the pilot script had been written by Matt and David, but but I participated in the rewrite of it. Um, so I didn't write an episode with my byline until the ninth episode. So yes, I was a fan of the first eight episodes, but I was also working on them. So so yes, I was a fan, but also working on them. That's beautiful. And then I, I want to wrap it up with this. Okay. Uh, I remember exactly where I was when I, what's that? Stay in school. (laughs) Don't do drugs unless. Don't do do drugs. Stay in school. Okay. I don't want to say don't do drugs because everybody knows I smoke a shit ton of weed. Uh, It's something. Oh yeah. Uh, It's so slim. 
I think people <laughs> who smoke a ton of weed are constantly eating junk food. It is a challenge. It's exp- it's weird because like I'll smoke a joint and then if I smoke one, I have to time it just right because it takes about anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes before the munchies to start kicking in. And if the munchies kick in and I'm downstairs, I am fucked and I'm putting on 15 pounds that week. So if I'm if I'm coming in, oh yeah, because because I'll sit there and I'm like, oh, I got sweets. So Swiss rolls. Now I need something salty, potato chips. Now I need something that's fucking pickled. Let's go pickles. Oh shit, I need something that's got a protein content. Peanut butter or fucking meat, here we go. And by the end of it, I'm looking, I'm closing the microwave, I'm looking at myself, I see Cheeto dust in my beard, uh, and then I'm just like, what the fuck am I doing with my right. life, Eric? And then I close that microwave door, I hit start on my hot pocket, I watch it, and then I look at myself and say, I'm never gonna do this again. And then I'm back in this situation 24 hours later, eating those pickles, those Oreos, and whatever else I got with the Swiss rolls. Interesting. Yes. So, but I did notice that if you work in a job that's high stress, like working in a kitchen, and it's hot, and you don't really have time to take a break or eat, and all you eat is a yogurt for lunch, you tend to stay fairly thin. And I'm not fairly and, thin. And, and yet, when I look at um, uh, Mario Batali, <laughs> he's fairly chunky because at this point in his career if you go back and look at Mario mario mario's pretty svelte uh oh, you know he's always interesting so you yeah. put on weight by owning restaurants more than working in restaurants <laughs> well you tend to i don't want to put words in anybody's mouth or, or say because because i'm a real big fan of mario i know it's not a good to say that because you know i don't know what he did i didn't really look into it but i, I think his treatment of female employees has much to be desired. Yes, but I know pasta, that. His pasta is great. Yes. Um, so we have to separate the two. Yes. As we have to separate his pasta. Yeah, you know, so it's, it, I definitely know in, in today's day and age, you can't really say you like somebody if they did something bad, but not everybody is good all the time. People uh, make mistakes, you know what I mean? People, if people think that um, Adolf Hitler was a rousing orator, yeah. I mean, he was a rousing orator. Oh, yeah. He got an entire nation to bend to his will. It doesn't mean you have to endorse his racial policies. And, you know, you should. Yeah, but a lot of people have a hard time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. People people get whipped back and forth by the trends of of internet communication, which make it very difficult to be uh, nuanced. Yeah. And then, like, at the end of the day, they really can't cancel anything I can do because all I do is I talk to my heroes, man. I talk to you guys uh, and you, got, you guys and gals, a few folks, I guess, because um, mm-hmm. you guys elicited a, a feeling. And that feeling I was, I was alluding to earlier, first time I ever saw Futurama. I can't remember if it came up in, the top, uh, in this conversation, but I know it's come up a couple times with my dad. I'm not really close with my dad at all. He went to prison when I was real, real young. Um, but What's when he got... What's that? What for? Uh, he decided that it'd be a good idea to take a whole bunch of drugs. He got hooked on painkillers. Oh, um, and yeah. this is the story I've heard. I've never, I, I talk to him every once in a while. He's actually, uh, he's actually going through a really aggressive battle with cancer, with liver cancer. Um, good to hear that. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's weird, man, because when you say like, oh, my dad's got cancer, you should feel something, right? And I don't want people to think i'm callous i don't want people I, at the end of the day i don't really give a shit what people think of me no, nor should you yeah it, it, I don't, there's too much energy wasted in that type of shit either you like me for who i am i try to be the best person i can be i work with what i've got and i try to make i try to be a good dad i try to be a good husband i try to be a good friend i try to be a good employee you know sometimes it's just you have life and emotion you, you have in a battery right you only have so much and if you look at it 100 percent, right you got a, a lot percentages of your battery through day to day through year to year through life to life i guess for certain things and for him it's just i can't so this is the story i've heard i don't know if it's true because i never really asked 100 uh, percent if the, the facts were here but this is what i've been told he got hooked on medical uh he got hooked on painkillers um and he decided he used to live in a duplex and his duplex was the other the other uh occupant was his boss and his landlord. So he decided to break into his boss and landlord's house while he was destroyed on painkillers. Head was fucked up, gone, just was not there. Um, decided to try to steal his tool belt and a TV. Back in the day in the 90s and shit, these TVs were fucking heavy. 
right? They're not no 15 pound, 67 inch TVs these days. Um, and what I was told, and I, like I said, I don't know if this part is true, that he overdosed because of all those pills. And then the guy actually had to call the, uh, the ambulance to get him out of here. And then the guy pressed charges on him, right? So he overdosed while he was trying to steal this stuff in his, uh, in his, his employer's house, right? Uh, so he goes to prison for five years. And I'm around six, I think, when this happens, maybe five or six. You know, we went and visited him a few times in prison. Um, wasn't fun at all. Like, apparently he was a great dad before the painkillers. The painkillers is what really made, like most people, fucks up your head. It fucks up your life. Um, so he gets out of prison. And when you're in prison, you're either getting fucked or you're fucking. And apparently he wasn't doing either. So he was chasing pussy as soon as he got out of prison. So apparently he wanted to see me for the summer and my mom made me go. I did not want to go. I'm it's fucking it's before 2000. It's before Y2K. I got a funny Y2K story that I'll tell you here in just a second too. So it's before that, but Futurama is, is, um, is showing up. When did Futurama, I want to make sure I got my years right. When did Futurama, do you remember when it, when it, uh, when it aired? 2000. 2000. Okay. So this is after Y2K. Um, so I remember, you know, not, ex not specifically the year, but I remember uh, watching this and I don't really have them around here, but I'm a huge Charles Schultz fan. I'm a huge Peanuts fan. I would, I still get the, the paper every Sunday specifically just to read the comic strips. So I remember sitting in my grandma phase, um, like a little office building area they had a tv out there it was where my dad was staying he had this little room off side of the garage and he was laying on a cot and i would sleep on the couch because they didn't really have much space for me anyways and he was staying with his parents because he just got out of prison so every sunday we would get the newspaper and i would get the comics right so i remember staying up really late because i wanted to hang out with my dad i knew that much i want i haven't seen him in a long time i wanted to hang out with him some way but he was off chasing pussy um, and I got to wrap it up right after the story. So he was out chasing pussy. So I'm flipping through the channels and Fox comes on and I was never a huge Simpsons guy back then. I was more of a King of the Hill guy because yeah. I just, the Simpsons, I didn't feel like it was for me. Now that I'm older, I absolutely love the Simpsons. Right. So I'm watching this and then the show ends and then Futurama kicks on. And then I remember I had the peanut strip up on the see-through glass door. And I'm tracing over just so I could figure out how to do Charlie Brown. And yes. Futurama comes on. And I'm like, holy shit, what is this going on? And the pilot's playing, the first season. Oh. Playing. And I'm just like, holy shit. This is cool as hell. I got to keep doing this. I got to keep watching this. And that was my first foray into Futurama. That's how I found Futurama, waiting for my dad to get home so we can hang out and we could talk and we could play and shit to drawing on this glass window because I want to be an animator when I was younger to watching Futurama and 20 plus years later, I'm here talking to one of the writers, man. Uh, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done, man. I know that was a kind of a shitty way to end a podcast, but beautiful way to end a podcast. Yeah. I'm an, I'm an open book, man. You can go and watch any episode and you're seeing me cry at least once, not every episode, but a lot of episodes were crying about something that I've found some emotional attachment to, or I'm talking, you know, at nauseam about something that I've just been obsessed with, you know? So I, I, I don't want to say I'm an open book, but I'm an open book when it comes to my life. Cause I just, once you've been around 80 dudes at one time in boot camp and you're being told, Hey man, drop your pants, drop your underwear. You're pissing into a cup, literally 17 minutes after you get off the bus, you really have no shame and you, you, know, you really an open book, man. So like I said, uh, it's been fun. I hope you've had fun and I hope you can, I hope you enjoyed, you know, the time on here. I did enjoy it. Uh, I enjoyed the chance to get to meet you, Julian, and get to know you better and and your mysteriously named friends and to answer their questions. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Beautiful. I really appreciate it, man. Well, uh, no other way to end this than how we do it every single time. And he's been Eric. I've been Julian. This is What's My Head podcast. And this has been another piece of your childhood. Good night.